p.m. Welcome to everybody. Um, one of the things that Sherry and I learned when we went through some school board training was that the school board members who are on Zoom need to introduce themselves, including our students. So if you would introduce yourself in which town you represent, that would be great. I'll go ahead and lead it off. Hello, all. My name is Anna Sessa, and I am from Reading, uh, representing Reading. Um, do you want me to popcorn to someone else, Carrie, or do you want to? Sure. All right, yes. I'm going to popcorn to my left, which is Bob Crean. Hi there. I'm representing the town of Pomfret, Vermont. Oh, then who? Marianne? Sure. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Marianne Ralph. I'm from Woodstock. Um, sorry, I'm not there in person. I have a, got a very bad cold from my kiddos, so just didn't want to spread any germs. Um, I will pass to Anne. Hi, Anne Carl from Killington. I'll pass to Ray. Ray Rice from Pittsfield. Go to Aiden. Um, hi, I'm Aiden Kiovella. I am a student at the uh, Woodstock Union High School. I don't necessarily represent this town. I'm from Bridgewater. And we'll pass it over to Owen. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll pass it over. Yeah. Um, I'm Owen Corsi. Also have a bad cold representing Barnard, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I'm a sophomore at the high school. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask if there are any um, amendments to the agenda. <laughs> All right, may I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, Ben and John seconded that. Thank you. All right, so at this time, we do have an opportunity for public comment. Is there anybody here from the public who would like to? Make a comment. If you're on Zoom, you can unmute or raise your hand. All right, seeing no hands, we'll move on now to uh, the reports, starting with the superintendent. Great. Good evening. I wanted to share a few things that we've been working on over this month. Uh, first of all, I was able to see uh, the student the power of our students' voice. We had two groups that presented at the Vermont Home the Vermont Superintendents Association Conference in Burlington. Um, six of our students shared their stories of success in becoming proficient readers at the middle school and high school. Um, they presented with their teacher, uh, reading specialist, Julie Brown. Um, another group of students, and two of them are here, will present on their work uh, to create an equity manifesto. So very proud of those students. They spoke really well about their experiences here at the middle school and high school, the impact and the work that they're doing. So very proud of that work. Um, some of the other work that I'm focusing on is planning our, helping to plan our last days and in service on June 16th and our leadership treat, retreat in July. Um, as you know, we've been working on our options-based responses to emergency situations. Um, in the last days of this school year, our faculty and staff will be working on responding to a movie or video on run, hide, and fight. What are their options? It's based on a video from um, Cal State College and gives us some really good um, expectations. They'll also begin to assess their own space and how they'll respond. Um, we've also looked at how we standardize um, how visitors enter our building. Um, the policy committee will be seeing some legislation that's coming down that's really specific to what we need to be doing, but we've already begun that work. Um, I included a link to a 16 minute video that really talks about how to avert targeted school uh, violence. I think it's a really good um, understanding for our leadership team I've looked at, and I think the board's kind of think of how we're focusing our energies and how we address those situations. Um, finally, we've been really looking at how do we address that data concern that we talked about, about the over-representation of male students or behavioral incident data. Um, Rap and I have been having conversations and we um, found some really good resources that I provided a link to. There's a short video, there's a podcast, and then there's an article on how this really is a national uh, situation. It's, and that we will be spending time with our leadership team, Raf's going to lead us through our local data 
and really beginning to understand what's the root cause of those uh, that data and how can we address that. Thank you, Sherry. Are there any questions or comments for Sherry at this time? I did want to say that I did review the video, the 16 minute video, and I was um, really pleased to see that the focus was not on punishment, but on restorative practices um, and trying to really work with the community to support um, those coming forward. So, uh, and I took a quick look at the link to the this of male studies and it looks very interesting. So thank you for providing that. All right, now we have a um, presentation from the Director of Technology and Innovation. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, before I share with you the couple of technology updates, I wanted to share some sad news. Um, one of our core technology members, Corey Canfield, has uh, entered his resignation. He accepted a position as a technology coordinator for a school district over in New Hampshire, closer to where he lives. And Corey, it didn't make it in time to the, to the board packet, but Corey um, joined us during the pandemic and actually started work remotely while we were in mm -hmm. lockdown and has been really instrumental. And we've been really fortunate to have Corey's expertise over the past couple of years. Um, his fingerprints are on all of the technology upgrades that we've done in all of our schools. Um, so Corey had a wealth of expertise. It's a very logical career step for him to be jumping to become a technology coordinator. And we're sad to see him go with wishing the best. And I wanted to just share with all of you that that's happening. We have some large shoes to fill in the next couple of weeks here um, as he prepares for his next week. Um, the two other pieces I wanted to share. Um, so we are excited to have uh, signed a contract for um, new classroom <laughs> displays. Um, so we've done a long process throughout this year where we've tested purchasing interactive displays and we've tested them out in all of our schools, um, gotten a lot of good feedback and learned from some of our, learned how to get them configured correctly. Um, and so we're purchasing 97 of these devices to be deployed throughout all of the learning spaces in all of our schools. So for the first time ever, we're gonna have consistent devices um, regardless of school. Um, these will be in K through 12 classrooms. Um, and this is all funded through PESSER. Um, so we're gonna be doing some training over the summer for teachers. And then um, we're excited they have a seven year warranty. Um, so we're, we're, we feel like this is gonna be a good solution for the next seven years for us. So that's a big piece. And then lastly, Sherry and I spent some time um, working with a group of Dartmouth students for the past couple of months, and we got to attend their final presentation uh, this past week. And these students, we gave them the task of popping the bubble for our students, so helping to expose our students to different um, viewpoints and um, ways to kind of get them outside of the small bubble with, with, with which they exist as um, teenage students. Um, so a lot of really good thoughts and conversations came out of it, um, and we're excited that there seems to be a partnership with Dartmouth where they've found some way to support us doing this work going forward for the next year as well. Um, so there'll be a way for students to engage in some conversations um, around issues that they're interested in with Dartmouth students um, for the next year. Thank you, Raph. Are there any questions or comments from for Raph? All right, thank you very much. From the Director of Student Support Services. Hi, I'm Sheena, I'm the Director of Student Support Services. And just when things feel like, oh, the year's winding down, my whole department is winding up for summer soap to begin, mm -hmm. as well as our special education programs that run parallel to that from transportation and staffing and programming and swimming at the rec center, which is really exciting for the kids. I've also been working with Garen Smale and the staff over at the high school and middle school to create some class offerings that are thinking outside the box a little bit and configurations that support our commitment to inclusion for all of our students in the building to have some unique opportunities that um, we haven't offered before. We've also been meeting with new families that have moved into our district or will be moving into our district to help get them settled in for a smooth start in September. And of course, encouraging any other 
families who might be interested in moving in that this is a great place to live and send your kids to school. And thinking ahead to next year uh, as well, we've had conversations that have just begun between myself, Kathleen McLean, who's our new special educator in the middle school and high school, uh, our uh, Beth Hazlett and Louise Spangle from our C3 program, because we're all interested in how we can create more job and world experiences for our students who are in our special education programs. Um, their you know, leadership in the C3 program is a wonderful conduit for that. And Kathleen brings a wealth of expertise from her involvement with Project Search and higher abilities uh, in the state of Vermont. So we're very excited how we can demonstrate and live our commitment for all of our students to be locally inspired and locally prepared. Thank you, Shana. Are there any questions or comments for Shana? All right, um, is Jen Staten here? So Jen is not here, but I'll quickly review. Jen is the which decided we're going to have her on the senior trip today, so she's probably on her way back from Boston. So I think she's provided some really significant resources here for you to see the varying plans in terms of what our professional development is for next year. Yeah, she has fully worked out our calendar, what's the plan for this fall through the school year, how that work will continue. It's also on our website so uh, teachers or future teachers can see how well mapped out our professional development is regarding um, our UDL work, uh, our literacy training, and our prepared K through four teachers. Um, in terms of future directions and decisions, um, all the elementary teachers learned about future directions the Department of, of CIA, um, including the piloting of our new um, EL literacy program. And I will say the majority of our teachers will be getting that work in June after students leave. They'll be doing professional development and receiving the materials. Um, and you can see there are many links there of all the different kinds of work that Jen has done to get us to this point, which is pretty heavy lift in a course of one year from training all the teachers, uh, pre-K four in the letters training, as well as helping those teachers to determine what literacy program that they will be using. Um, she also provided information around the coherence of that work, both in mathematics and literacy, with some links to, to additional information. We are this. All right, thank you, Sherry, any comments? Questions? Pretty cool. I'm quite familiar with EL. It's a very high level, um, high expectation uh, literacy curriculum. Uh, I think I'll like it once they get to understand how it all works together. But what I love about it is it integrates um, other subject matter into the literacy piece, like science, social studies, and things like that. Yeah, which ended in include myself, Raf, Jen, uh, Julie Brown, Audrey Richardson, and Patty Kelly will be meeting next week to begin to map out how do we measure success beyond our test scores. And so we do a, a variety of literacy and math assessments. Does it impact attendance? Does it impact our um, behavioral reports? So by launching into a literacy program that really is focused on 90% proficiency by third grade. How does that um, show student outcomes in a variety of ways? And so we'll begin mapping that out, what's the work we've been done, and then how do we follow those test scores and those other measures to ensure that we're on the right pathway to accomplish that goal. All right, thank you. Um, now we have Jim Fenn, the Director of Finance and Operations. Sure. Um, our, our budget spending is going as expected. So uh, nothing really new there to report. I did give you a brief paragraph in the uh, in the board book, and I did attach uh, budgets so that you can um, see where we are. Uh, I've been working on borrowing. Uh, later this evening, you'll be uh, hopefully approving the tax anticipation note for next year. Uh, just so you know, we paid off the current year's tax anticipation note last month so that we avoided a month's worth of interest in uh, doing that. Um, our general obligation loans, the three loans for the three warrant articles for the three projects, are we're not ready for this evening. We'll probably be asking on the 19th that we have a very brief five or 10 minute board meeting to approve those before we go into committee meetings on that evening. Um, right now it's going back and forth between the attorney and the bank and they're uh, discussing the different language changes. 
So that's coming. Uh, something really exciting, at least for me uh, today, is they were putting a telephone pole out here in our parking lot. And that's a telephone pole where the power is coming for our electric buses. And so we're making progress. We've received the cash for the buses. We haven't received the buses yet, but we're moving forward. And that was exciting to see them send that telephone pole. It's the little things that thrill us right now. And that was, that was one of them, you know? We actually ran out into the parking lot, Jim and I, and we got some GMP. <laughs> yeah. We were so excited. <laughs> and, and like Raph, I've had a change in my office. Um, Young lady that we hired last year to be our accountant, who was doing an amazing job, decided that school accounting was not her thing, has gone back to the private sector. Um, Sarah Walker, our payroll clerk, has stepped up and she wants to do that job. So she's moving in there. So I'm looking for a payroll clerk. And so, you know, if you know anybody, please, you know, send them our way. Uh, we'll be short staffed for a bit, but we will survive and life goes on. All right. Thank you, Jim. Any questions for Jim? It's a very quiet group this week. <laughs> That's good. Um, uh, student representatives, it's time for your presentation. Go for it. Yeah. So student life has been pretty busy over the past few weeks. Uh, we started off the month of May with um, some AP testing and some standardized testing, which went generally well with the student body. And I think there was a lot of kind of stress and work around that. The teachers were very supportive of students during that time. Um, we transitioned smoothly into just kind of the end of the year. We'll soon start finishing up some final projects and uh, their non-AP classes. Um, and, you know, some students in AP classes are also, you know, diving into some fun activities like movies and field trips. Some students are also engaging into some final projects. Um, outside of school, um, we've been, a lot of students have been doing a lot of good work with, um, our EID and, um, equity and inclusion work, uh, like Sherry mentioned earlier on, uh, the Friday, the 19th, um, a group of students, um, including Owen and I accompanied Jen Stain and Audrey Richardson and presented our work around equity and inclusion, which included the two branches of unity and coherence and freedom and voice. And we presented that to educators and administrators at the BSA conference in Burlington. Um, there was another group who went uh, with Julie Brown to uh, talk about and present their work on literacy. Um, the Social Action Club continues their work with the mascot, uh, continuing kind of spreading discussions and advisories uh, among students just to get some ideas flowing about, you know, the background of the mascot, you know, initial thoughts and how they connect to the mascot. Um, and generally students are, you know, tired pushing through the end of the year, but we have a lot of high hopes and moral for the uh, coming summer months. Thank you, Aiden. Yeah, right. so it's, uh, it's a busy few weeks towards the end. It's a hundred meter dash, uh, but I think we're doing pretty well. We've got some good tests, uh, sports championships coming our way. We had student government elections recently. Um, we, I was talking to some freshmen and some juniors, and I think Cognia testing seemed to be, I called it a seam full transition. Uh, <laughs> I think that's, I think that's pretty true. I think the confusion <laughs> that, uh, that RAF and, and all of our administrators were feeling was kind of echoed a bit in, in the actual test itself, but whatever, it's standardized testing. So I don't think anyone's going to be too enthusiastic about it, but <laughs> Um, <laughs> seniors are, are done, uh, for a few months until they're off to their futures. Um, I think this is a pretty, you know, when we look at these big documents, like the portrait of a graduate, I think we can look at this year and say that we're taking steps towards success on those documents. Um, it's a pretty interesting group of, of students that we're sending off into the world this year. So that's cool to see. Um, we met for our student leadership summit briefly. Uh, we've managed to get some grant funding approved for that. So we'll be picking some focus uh, points and and uh, enacting some goals for that event, uh, which we'll use towards our WASP mascot kind of conversations and, and we'll take it from there. So that's all I've got. 
All right, thank you, Owen and Aiden. Does anyone have a comment or question for our students? All right, thank you. Um, at this time, we'll move into our presentations and I'd like to welcome Nate Levinson to join our meeting and talk about new solutions. So if I can take a minute to introduce, uh, introduce Nate, um, I've been having I have had a great opportunity of working him with him for many years. Um, some of you may know that he was um, so informative as we rethought about special education <clears throat> funding and how we fund our public schools. And his team came in and did a deep dive in terms of how do we use resources to meet student needs. Um, last summer, the leadership team wrote read his latest book in terms of how do we think about budgets, school budgets, smarter schools, smarter budgets. Um, Nate's team also has been really involved in looking at scheduling as one of the aspects in terms of addressing equity. Um, we were, I think I've presented to the, the board before about how we see our schedule is kind of like the third leg of the school. We're doing deep professional development and literacy and mathematics. We're looking at our curriculum and materials, but unless we have a schedule that's really aligned with this professional development and these resources, it's really hard to achieve the goals of, of those programs. And so through some extra funding and our work to be to offer a really equitable experience for all our students, we were able to bring Nate and his team in. And he is tonight presenting on the results of that work, meeting with our teachers, meeting with our leadership team, and doing a lot of professional development with all of us. Good evening, Nate. Hi, Sherry. Great to be with all of you. Uh, excited to share what we learned and what we did. Um, let, let me just uh, build on a little bit of what Sherry shared. In many ways, there's no such thing as a great schedule. There are schedules that allow you to, great, to do great things, like implement really effective literacy programs or um, have really cost-effective budgets that provide a lot of opportunity and a lot of variation and a lot of um, options for kids. So budget, excuse me, schedules are essentially a means to ends. Um, and one of the things that we saw and shouldn't surprise anybody given the history of um, the supervisory union is depending on which school you went to, given its history, given its size, lots of different things were going on with the schedule. And what we were asked to do was to do a deep review of what is currently happening uh, with schedules and the use of time in each of the elementary schools to also um, help the leadership team think through what is the best use of time. And then lastly, to ask and help folks think through, hey, what things should happen in every school because they're so important to your priorities that there really should be some consistency uh, across your schools, but to also acknowledge that every school is clearly not the same. Um, and so what things needn't be the same. Um, and that's kind of the work we were asked to do. Um, I would say, and we'll share some of the background research and what we found in a moment, and I'll definitely keep it brief, but I would say that it was, um, at least from our perspective, a highly successful engagement and that we're able to learn some really important things, able to have really thoughtful conversations with principals and central office leaders, who ultimately I think are going to make really good choices um, that reflect both some things that are too important, so there will in fact be equity across schools, and at the same time really reflect uh, the differences in size and history of the school. So, at least from our perspective, it all went very, very well. Let me share my screen and walk you through just a, a few thoughts of what makes for great elementary schedules and what did we find and suggest uh, for you all. And I'm hoping folks are seeing the screen. Cherry, folks seeing the screen? Yes, Outstanding. I love it when it works. So strategic elementary schedules. Let's just start with what do we mean by a strategic schedule? Because I think too often when folks sit down to schedule, sometimes the goal can be just make all the periods and all the staff and all the options fit. And if it fits, that's good. Um, but a strategic schedule does more than make all the parts and pieces fit. It takes your strategy and your strategic priorities and it brings them to life. It supports and encourages teaching and learning best practices. 
it increases student engagement, and it ensures equitable opportunities uh, across your school. So that's what we mean when we say, hey, let's help you build strategic schedules, not just schedules that fit. Um, and, and at least our perspective is that you really can't expect outcomes to change if your schedules don't change. You really can't expect to put in new literacy programs and, and run them effectively with old schedules. So as your world changes, as your goals change, so should your schedules. A um, couple of the really foundational theories behind building great schedules. Uh, the first is that more time spent on quality academic instruction results in more student learning. Let me dissect that really briefly. That basically says, hey, if you spend an hour teaching math, assuming it is well taught with a well-designed curric well curriculum, kids will learn more math than if you taught 45 minutes of math. Um, time really does matter. And what we have seen uh, across the country is sometimes um, without noticing it, some of your really important areas have been getting less and less time, or you see from one school to another, uh, one school might have 45 minutes and one might have an hour. And I think historically, and I spent six years on a school board, so I've been in your shoes, I have spent years as a superintendent as well. And sometimes you look at a schedule and say, oh, it's pretty close. You know, school A's got 45 minutes, school B's got 60, just 15 minutes difference. One of the key research findings is that's a really big difference. Over the course of a year, you should expect very different outcomes for many of your students, especially kids who are learning a little slower or starting a little further behind. So how much time you spend really matters on each subject. The other thing that's a really important finding across strategic schedules and across country is that elementary schedules are becoming more detailed. I'm an old guy. I've been around a while. I can remember 20 years ago when the principal said, I'm building the schedule for an elementary school. This is what it looked like meant they scheduled lunch and recess and art and the rest of the day was left blank because every teacher figured out what to do. We don't see nearly as much of that today. Um, what we see in most school districts is, hey, you really need 90 minutes of reading and it should be in the morning and you're going to have math in the afternoon and that's going to be for an hour and that's going to be after recess and we're doing that so special educators and interventionists know when to show up or not show up. So we're seeing most districts having some of the big blocks spelled out. Um, I would say in, in your district, you have some of this and you still have a fair amount of things that are loose. But the best practice, and particularly if you think about the science of reading or any high quality reading program, and I know you've been making a really large investment there, how you spend that big block of reading time really, really, really matters. Um, how much time goes to phonics is important, and the amount of time would be different at kindergarten than it would be at third grade. How much time is word work or guided reading? Um, and even math classes, we're seeing more and more of them thinking about how much time is devoted to practice and how much is whole instruction and how much is small group. So the trend and better schedules call out how the big blocks of time should be divided up and we call these micro schedules. Uh, this will feel a little different and maybe a little weird to some of your staff, but it is without a doubt a, a best practice and a necessity to implement some of your new curriculum really well. I think one of the points that I really wanna stress upon uh, the board and anybody listening is that small differences matter a lot. So let's take two classrooms, let's say it's first grade. Classroom A is spending 20 minutes on phonics every day and classroom B, 15 minutes most days, occasionally because we got an assembly, an early release, we got photos to take, whatever the reason, some days there's no phonics so something's got to give. You look at this and you say, huh, yeah, I kind of prefer classroom A to classroom B, but they're both doing pretty good. It's because it's just five minutes difference. 
But we can't ever, ever, ever say it's just five minutes. Why? Because five minutes and skipping a day every once in a while actually turns out to be 24 hours difference over the course of the year in how much phonics construction was taught. What does that mean? That is, means that kids in classroom B, it is the same as if they were absent for 72 days from being in classroom A. There is no way you would have a student who was out 72 days and would you be surprised that they were struggling to read? You would not be surprised that they were not making a year's growth. You would certainly not be surprised they weren't catching up if they started behind. So what we've seen is from the research is these relatively small differences uh, pile up over the course of a year into very meaningful differences. And for kids who are struggling to read, for example, uh, if they are assigned to classroom B, their chance of staying on grade level or catching up are much, much lower than if they were in classroom A. And as Sherry talked about scheduling and equity of scheduling, this is a classic example of the experience and the needs of a student vary dramatically based on what classroom or what school they were in. Another really important point um, when we think about great schedules, strategic schedules, is having core instruction is obviously very important. Having the right amount of core instruction is very important. But for kids who struggle to learn, kids who are behind, and this is with or without an IEP, they're going to need extra time to learn on top of, not instead of, core instruction. So if I struggle to read, you need to give me extra time to learn to read. Some people call this intervention time, some people call it win time, but you need both core instruction and a lot of it, plus extra time to learn. That combination brings about mastery, kids catching up and staying on track. What we saw was some schools, some grades had reasonable amounts of extra time, some had a little bit of extra time to catch up and some had much less or none. And again, another example of strategic schedules bring equity to ensuring that everybody who needed that extra time got the extra time. Um, what's weird, and I'm weird is like the only word I can think of, is that for many students who struggle, they actually get less time, not more time. So I want to say that one more. Kids who struggle with and without IEPs often get less time to learn than the kids who are right on grade level. How's that happen? is because, hey, we're giving them speech therapy, and maybe that happens during reading. Uh, maybe we're giving them extra help in reading, but maybe that happens during math. Sometimes extra help in reading happens during reading, but then, then it's not actually extra, it's just different. Um, so one of the other really important pieces is you've got to build your schedule so that kids who are getting extra services, with, whether it be reading intervention, speech therapy, I had six years of speech therapy, uh, so I know how important it is, but it was really important that I also learned to read and learn to do math. And so we have to create schedules that allow these extra services to happen, but they happen not during reading, not during math. And if I'm supposed to get extra help in reading or math, that it really is extra, not instead of. So these are just some of the most important um, best practices that helped guide um, our support of the, the district supervisor union creating strategic schedules. So what did we find? Six things to feel really, really good about. And good news never gets enough attention. So let me start with things to celebrate. I uh, thought the supervisory union is making really substantial and thoughtful commitment to implementing the science of reading. Um, people have been trained, curriculum have been bought. There's a lot of planning going on, and that's just great. Uh, some of the schools have already taken the initiative to implement a number of the scheduling best practices. So those, those practices I shared with you, um, those are already happening in some of your schools. So I don't want anybody to be wondering or thinking, hey, I think we do that. And what I would say is virtually every best practice is happening somewhere, but it is not happening at every grade and in every school. And, and a strategic schedule would bring those best practices to all the kids who need them. Um, 
The SU's made really important strides to ensure students who struggle academically are supported by certified teachers rather than less well-trained paraprofessionals. Really important improvement. Um, also seen, and I think related to number three is number four, that the supervisory union has invested in highly skilled reading and math interventionists. Uh, these are the folks who can provide that extra time and in instruction, which is great. Uh, we're seeing teachers collecting data about reading proficiency and reading skills and using it to form reading groups, another best practice. And I really was impressed. You know, I've worked with over 250 school districts in 30 states. I will also say I've worked with more than half the school systems in Vermont. And clearly in Vermont, there's always been and will continue to be, I think for a while, this push pull between should the schools be completely independent and very different from each other, or should they all be the same? There's a common Vermont discussion and I was really impressed with how the leadership was committed to finding the right balance of really saying, hey, there are some things, not a lot of things, but some things that are so important, they should be best practices happening in every school. And at the same time, being very cognizant that, and respectful that there are differences in size and history and student needs so that not everything had to be the same. And I think as we guided the principals through this work, they too embraced and I think felt that a really good balance was being achieved of some things being consistent and some things being different. And that can be a hard balance to find. And I felt the district was doing a really nice job in doing just that. So six commendations, six things to feel very, very good about. There were more, but these certainly rose to the top. And then we had five uh, recommendations. The first is to develop use of time expectations for the most critical best practices. This means as a supervisory union, you have to decide how much time should go to phonics in kindergarten, how much time should go to phonics in second grade, how much time should go to all the elements of teaching reading, how much time should go to math uh, across the, the schools. And obviously they can differ by grade, but they should not differ by school. So creating what we call use of time expectations, but not for everything, but for the most critical best practices. Um, that would include, for example, making sure every student who needs uh, win time, intervention time gets it. Shouldn't matter which school I go to. Uh, so that was our probably our single most important recommendation. And, and that will have significant impact on the experience of kids, it will have significant impact on your ability to effectively implement the reading curriculum, and ultimately it is going to raise achievement in a very good way. Second, we want to make sure that the specials, this is art, music, PE, all the other courses, um, and the intervention staffing, that's the interventionists, reading teachers, we want to make sure those really important things happen, but happen in a way that facilitates implementing best practices. What do I mean by that? The most common comment we heard from principals and we see it across the country is, whoa, we can't do the amount of time we need on reading or we can't schedule the reading teacher because art has to happen at 930. It is very common, particularly in small elementary schools, for the specialists the specials, art, music, PE, et cetera, to actually drive the entire schedule. And it is very common to see that we're not providing enough intervention in school A and a little bit too much in school B because the staffing didn't allow for it. What we're saying is that as you build your schedules, you figure out what do I need for art teachers and when do I need them to be there? and how many hours of an interventionist do I need? And that's what you staff for, that's what you schedule for. We actually suggest building your schedule before you build your budget. Most districts do it in the other direction, build their budget first, and then even sometimes assign specialists to school second, and then they ask the principal to go build the schedule, which I call doing the best you can with the hand you were dealt. No, 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 no. We need to stack the deck. We need to deal every principle the best hand because we already figured out what the winning hand was. 
Um, so this is a, a process change that would really help bring these great schedules to life. Uh, opportunity number three is to staff, staff and schedule mixed grade classrooms slightly differently. As you know, some of your schools have say a kindergarten first grade class or second third grade class. These multi-age classrooms are a necessity given your size and the desire to keep small schools, particularly when it comes to math. Teaching math in a mixed grade classroom is really, really hard. There are practices called split block scheduling. I will not go into all the details of them tonight unless somebody wants to know, but a split block scheduled math class is simply better for kids and easier to teach. To do that though, you have to staff and schedule your specials slightly differently. It's not a huge difference, but it meant that you had to plan to do that in the first place. And what we're seeing now is your principals are really thoughtful, try to do that when they can. Some years they can, some classrooms they can, and some they can't because the cards they were dealt either allowed a little of it, a lot of it, or none of it. And again, great example, going back to point number two, uh, figure out what you need to do split grade math blocks, and then have enough staff there, have enough time there and have them come at the right times during the day. It is really a matter of getting the horse in front of the cart. Um, opportunity number four is one I do want to take a minute or two to explain. And this is to revise the special rotations to maintain or even expand offerings while preserving sufficient time for core instruction and intervention. There's a phrase and a concept called time blocked specials. And what a timed block special means is that as a school system, you say, hey, we're gonna spend five hours a week in specials or six hours a week or three hours a week or seven hours a week in specials. You look at your schedule, you think about what, how much time should go to each activity, and then you create this block of time for specials. Then completely separate, now that you, let's say I'm just taking an easy number, uh, four and a half hours of specials, just picking a number. Then you have a really different discussion of, hey, what do I want to do during those four and a half hours? Maybe I want to do five different topics. Maybe I want to do eight different topics. Maybe I want to do a set of topics for the first half of the year and a different set of topics for the second half of the year. What we have found is in most school districts that people can uh, conflate which specials you teach and how much time you're going to spend on it. So for example, you know, if, if you're going to teach Spanish, great, but should that require more time for specials? Right now, what we see in your district, I see this in other districts around say uh, maker spaces or STEM, where somebody says, hey, I want to add this extra special. And that implies more time to specials which means less time to something else. That's not the healthiest conversation because you should be able to add additional specials, but put it into the same amount of total time devoted to specials. Maybe you move to an eight day rotation so things don't happen every week. Um, maybe you do different specials at the beginning of the year or the end of the year. What we're really suggesting is that first you decide how much time should go to specials, step one. And that's based on looking at all the needs of students and all the time in the day. Then step two is how do you want to allocate time? Um, how do you want to allocate that time to which specials and how often? I think it's different from how you're currently doing it and how many districts currently do it, but it's all, we find it can really help expand the range of offerings without eating into core instruction and time for intervention. And then the last comment we had uh, was to treat time like it is precious. And what I mean by that is there's so much you want to do in a day. The day is never going to be long enough to do all the things you want. Um, and really, as you map out your schedule, thinking about, hey, can we save two minutes here? Can we shave five minutes here? Um, thinking about every minute in the day is really, really important. Our sense was that some teachers and some schools really already do that. And others, 
I would say we're a little more casual about how they scheduled and use time during the day. And we just think it's uh, so valuable and so much you want to do. Uh, create schedules that get as, all the right stuff in there and no minute is wasted. And with that, happy to take any questions or comments and I will stop sharing my screen. All right, Elliot has a question. So I have a question is, do we have any evidence that um, certain times of the day are better for certain subjects for learning? Like, like yeah. math being in the morning yeah. or reading in the morning? Or Great question. Uh, there is a lot of evidence and it is surprising. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, now, I will be the first to acknowledge that most classroom teachers believe that teaching literacy in the morning is best, and quite honestly, teaching math in the morning is also best. Um, the research says having a, a great curriculum and a great teacher matters more than anything else. And here's a really interesting point. Let's assume for a moment, and this happened in the district I was running, every teacher didn't believe the research, wouldn't be the first time. And so all the teachers taught reading first thing in the morning, then had a, some other activity, and then taught math. All that happened before lunch. Here's what happened to all those kids. Speech therapy, half of speech therapy has to happen before lunch, which meant half of all kids getting speech therapy got pulled from reading or math. Uh, same was true for all special ed services that were pull out. Half of it had to happen during reading or math. So the best practice is to stagger across the school when reading is, when math is, when intervention is. And so by staggering those throughout the entire day, some in the morning, some in the afternoon, uh, much better things happen. Like you get to get 100% of core instruction, you have more teachers available for intervention, and the research was just really clear. Teaching something in the afternoon is not a problem. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks. This was a really fabulous presentation and just really interesting. And I really appreciate it. You can tell a lot of work went into it. So thank you so much. Okay. Uh, ben and then Matt. Yeah, thanks, Nate. That's uh, really wonderful stuff. Uh, we've had some conversations um, kind of leading up to your presentation. And one of the things that um, uh, kind of comes out, maybe you can speak to this, on number four on your last slide, the, the message on special seemed to be kind of something has to give, right? That if you want to teach, um, you know, whether I think you mentioned STEM or Spanish, that you know, that's going to come at a cost and that cost shouldn't be your core subjects of reading or math. And I wonder if you had any, any thoughts about kind of teaching um, reading in particular across the curriculum. Say if you have you know, social studies or some other, or say it's STEM, um, mm -hmm. If you can, you know, use those other subjects that may be considered a special to kind of advance the objectives of your of your reading uh, curriculum. Yeah, so I, I think there are two different directions. It's a great question. Um, I think there are two different directions in which things get integrated. So if you said, "Hey, we're going to teach social studies from nine to ten, and that's going to also count as reading," that's actually been not that effective um, mm -hmm. because the reading curriculum is well scripted it is well designed and they every minute is called for and so it has to be reading first during reading now that said um when you are teaching reading and teaching writing you need to read something and you need to write about something and you can take the reading curriculum that you purchased and say hey i see it calls for six book reports half of them can be tied to the social studies standards and you could have level reading books tied to the reading um, program. So I do think that you can bring some science and bring some social studies into reading, um, but it is really important that the reading curriculum came first and the subject matter, the content of reading and writing can definitely be math and science. I have found it is much more problematic when you try to teach purely and primarily math or science content and say, hey, we'll write about it, we'll read about it, and that will count as reading. It really does that. That's great. Thank you so much. I mean, I think as we kind of embark upon our really ambitious, um, you know, reading achievement goals, 
one of the things we're realizing is that there could potentially be a cost to some things that you know are kind of precious to a lot of people. So that's a little, yep. that's encouraging. Yep. And again, one of the things that I've really seen about and what I call about this time bounding, and I, you know, we, I've looked at your schedules in incredible detail. Um, yes, you don't have enough time, like every other district in the country, to do everything you want in the way and in the form you want it. I totally feel that pain, and it takes a lot of time to teach reading well, as a fact. Um, what I do think, though, if you can break the mindset of, hey, and I'll just pick Spanish as an example, but I've seen it with STEM, I've seen it with other things, where you say, hey, if I teach Spanish, that will take two extra hours a week. And then the question is, do you have the two extra hours? What do you have to give up for those two hours? And I just see so often this very binary discussion of a topic and more time or no topic for less time. That's an either or situation. I will tell you as a, when I was on the school board, we thought a lot about Spanish. We actually thought a lot about SCL. We wanted to do more of each and we were not going to cut into core instruction and we were not going to cut into intervention. So what we said is, hey, we looked at library and said we're going to do that once every 10 days instead of once a week. So we could pick up an SEL class once every 10 days in its place. We looked at Spanish. We said that's really important. We put it into the rotation instead of having a five day rotation. We had a 10 day rotation and it became I forget, maybe it was two out of 10 days that we did Spanish, but if we did not increase the number of hours or minutes in a week that went to our specials, but we actually increased the number of special subjects that we were teaching. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just a really healthy conversation of, you know, if you think about, and I'm just gonna pick a number an hour a day, that's 180 hours a year of specials. How do you want to slice those 180 hours? And some people do it, you know, the first of the year is different than the last of the year. And there are a lot of ways to do it. And I think if you move past the discussion of either we have it the way we've done it, or we don't have it at all, um, better answers come. All right, thank you, Matt. Um, do you recommend customizing it based on the grade level? like? say the hours of specials in a week could be different for sixth graders versus second graders, yep. or is it easier to implement if you just make it standard K through six? Yeah, so I think the, for, I think the broadest answer is um, the use of time should change by grade level. Now, not, not necessarily everything, but as you, as I have helped folks build use of time, you know, what happens in kindergarten necessarily should not be the same for sixth grade. Um, there are certain things like keeping the length of the blocks similar um, can really help. Uh, but generally speaking, I don't see it a requirement that every grade be the same. Just be thoughtful and one, about it. And then one more question. So I have a third grade boy who's just about to turn 10 and he can eat all day long and he can move all day long. And so I was looking at your schedule and it had one lunch, one, one recess. Like how, like how much should you be micro scheduling uh, movement and snacks so that, you know, you get optimal learning? Sure. Yeah, so I think there are a couple ways around that. Um, what we've seen is generally most elementary schools will have one lunch and re one recess. And then they will have, um, for example, snacks while instruction is going on. So this is the idea of treating time as precious. I will tell you as an adult, I eat while I work and hold lots of meetings with uh, uh, my staff while we're eating. Um, it is not at all uncommon to see, you know, for kids who want to graze or eat more often, that you don't stop the whole class for 10 minutes to do just that. Um, and I think as far as like, um, uh, energy breaks and the need to move up and getting around. Again, I find really thoughtful teachers are looking at the moment, know their classes and take a two minute break and get everybody doing jumping jacks or running around and then they get back to work. Um, I totally get that you got to create time for those things. 
but the idea of treating time as precious doesn't mean don't do the things that need to be done. It means don't just say, hey, here's 20 minutes for snack, in which kids will probably get it done in three minutes. Um, so you're going to have to weave some of those in, and those might be some things that teachers do as and when they see a need. All right, Owen and then Anna. Yeah, thank you. This is like uh, a really great perspective. Um, I was wondering on um, kind of like at the high school level, given that there's some optionality with our courses, I know for me and for a lot of others, some years end up being like very science heavy or like very English heavy. And, and that's, I imagine, not the best system for, for your work. So I wonder, like historically, have you found it better to project like, hey, instead of you need two art credits to graduate at the end of 12th grade, is it better to say instead like you need a half credit every year and that takes them up an hour of your day? I'm just wondering what you've done in the past sure. with that. Yeah, sure, great question, Owen. So obviously our study only looked at the elementary, but what we've seen, particularly in smaller high schools, two strategies to getting kind of the, the right courses and the right variety of courses. One is, to um, basically map your schedule like you will when you go to college as a freshman, like the first thing you do, even if you're not sure of your major, you, you're sitting with the guidance counselor and mapping out uh, college courses right through senior year. And every semester you reevaluate that, including saying, whoa, this course isn't even offered my junior year, so I better take it as a sophomore because I don't want to risk waiting to my senior year. So we do see that smaller high schools actually increase the number of courses they offer by offering some things every other year or just for one semester not both semesters so in the same way that i uh, so you create more opportunity by having more courses but they don't happen full year every year which then just pushes you to this need to plan so first of all, as a student, you got to know that this course you're interested in is going to be offered your sophomore and senior year, but not your junior year, or it's going to be offered first semester, but never second semester. And then you really kind of put together the map um, for, for all four years and then go back and revisit it a couple times a year. And that gets you the schedule that works for you and gives you more options without adding more cost to the system. All right, Anna and then Sam, anybody else? Yeah, thanks so much for being here, Nate. This is really right. enlightening. Uh, my question uh, is how, how does the school board, how does the administration, how does staff move forward with this information? Um, I have an opinion, but I don't know that this is the right place for it. And I'm just trying to test the waters as to how, sure. how all of this enlightenment will be um, put into place. Sure, so I will start with Kids are the same and adults are different. So I do think like how you roll things, it's like what the kids need do not change a lot from district to district. Like the best practices are what they are. But I do think culture and context matters a lot on how things are rolled out. Um, I think that what we learned about your system is teachers had a lot of autonomy and schools have been very different. So I think as you move forward, one is you need to start with the principals and the leadership team looking at the research and saying, hey, this is what good really looks like. This is what ultimately would serve our students best. And often with schedules, like you create the schedule for two or three years out, this is what we want to get to. And depending on the system, it can be too big of a change to say, and we're going to get there next year. Um, this transition to best practice schedules to strategic schedules will probably take you a few years and i think that you'd probably want to say for next year some things really do need to change like if you're going to roll out your literacy program and you've done all that training i don't see how you wait um including with micro schedules that just seems criminal to not um given your goals and your priorities uh changing the specials Maybe you need a year to think that through. Um, creating micro schedules, I think you need to do that. I think that as a leadership team, first you figure out where you want to be at the end of the day. Then you figure out how many steps 
whether it's one year, two years, or three years, it's going to take to get there. I think it also is valuable to share with your staff why you're doing this. I mean, there are only two reasons you move to common schedules. You're a controlling group of people who just want to tell others what to do, <laughs> or you really have the best interest of kids at heart and you've under, come to understand the research and you said it's too important to not do some of this. I think it's really valuable for teachers to understand the why, not just the what. And I think getting feedback from teachers, not on, hey, do you like it or not, but on, hey, what's working for you? What's giving you problems? And how do we make this work smoother? So that's kind of my sense of how this happens. It doesn't happen overnight, but you do need to be fairly firm that you're going to get to a really good place in a step or two or three. Brilliant, thanks. So then it sounds like, Sherry, you'll be the next step as far as what we will take from this and move forward with? Right, just again, add to what Nate has shared with us. Um, we have mapped out and with the help of Julie, Julie Brown, what our expectations for literacy is pre-K to six, starting at 142 minutes of literacy, uh, pre-K through three, up to 90, now we're reducing that to 90 minutes by sixth grade, kind of what Matt was speaking about. Um, looking at 75 minutes across the district for mathematics with a goal of increasing that to 90 minutes as best practice. Um, but this right now, all the principals are working with teachers to see how that micro scheduling can be fit in. Um, you know, again, uh, well, this is here. How does that work in a multi-age classroom? How does that offer uh, happen in some of our bigger elementaries? So I know all our principals are working with classroom teachers right now to see how that model will work. So I'm really excited, and they're excited. They've done this letters training. They want to implement this new curriculum. They know that this will make a difference. They asked for this. They knew after the training that the schedule we have would not allow them to deliver the kind of teaching practices and curriculum they're so excited about doing. The same as mathematics. They knew with different amounts of time, they want to get to 90 minutes, we'll get there. It's a transition, so first year 75 minutes, next, you know, and the next step will be nine minutes of mathematics. And then thinking about how do all those other pieces fit in. So the teachers are a key piece to that. Um, working with our U18, you know, Nate's given us a lot of different ideas of how do we do our unified arts, but really putting those priorities to literacy and mathematics that evolve over time and give students options over time. So it's an exciting time. I know the principals have had lots of great conversations with their teachers and their teachers are really being creative on how we make this work. It's, it's exciting. Sam had a question? Uh, or Actually, I, I, okay. I wanted to know some of Sherry's thoughts and the teachers' thoughts yeah. on this. And, yes. and really, it came to the teachers. They knew they could not continue with the schedules they had to deliver the curriculum they've been trained to do. So it's great. Any, anybody else? Can I, can I speak one more time? Yes, you can. Uh, I would just really like to voice my opinion against having snack while learning. There's so much mental and nutritional health that goes around taking brain break, being present with your food, um, uh, ideation around food and food issues really can stem from what we in our industry like, or in the adult industry like to call uh, learn in lunch. Um, and there really is a lot of evidence behind taking that break and eating and only eating, not eating while you are doing something. So I don't know if that's going to become part of the curriculum, but I really would argue against it. Thank you, Anna. Thanks. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you very much, um, Nate. That was most informative. And um, I'm sure that a lot of conversations will continue and can be implemented. So uh, you're very welcome. And as I said, I, I think you're a great group of people, great group of leaders trying to move both in the right direction and to do it in a very thoughtful way. And I, I think just at every juncture, you just want to be remembering time is precious and the schedule should reflect your priorities and take a few steps to get to that best possible schedule. So best of luck. Um, Thank you. Have a great night. Um, Sherry is now going to give a, a short um, survey results presentation around the climate study that was done. All right, I'm just giving you a second to get into. Oh, this is gonna be fun. Hmm. Oh, 
Oh, sorry. <clears throat> As many of you know, you have to take it in the field. You know, you your pause up there. Make sure I pick the right one. There we go. Hang on. Don't look at my email. I have to go back. <laughs> I'm trying to pull the presentation up. So as many of you know, we um, did our climate survey this spring, uh, March into, uh, some went into February. I'm just gonna, don't get dizzy here. Um, so we took time as a leadership team to break down the data, both locally by school and across the district and uh, nationally. And so I really wanted to take some time to share that data with you. Is it working? Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. The slides show. So what I have prepared for you for tonight, there you go, bright colors keep you awake, um, is to look at that data by the three different groups that were assessed locally and nationally, and then break down that groups. So just to remember, we I'm just going to give you an overview of why we picked Claudia as our survey. Um, I'm going to give you a summary of findings and then some next steps. Hey Sherry. So, yes. Sherry, you are not yes. you're not screen sharing to Zoom. You're just sharing to your monitor. Ah, okay. Hang on one second. Let me do this. And let me go to here. Thank you, Raina. I apologize for all the main things I said earlier today. <laughs> she knows ah, there you go. You are a wonderful individual to work with. <laughs> okay, back to, uh, again, we always begin with a strategic plan. Um, in that, one of the goals was cultivating trust, transparency, and inclusion across our towns and stakeholders. Um, and strategy 744 was around identifying and administrating a district-wide climate survey to be given annually to parents, educators, and students. So just to know that's where we began with this work. Oh, on the wrong way. There we go. So we looked at, myself and Shana looked at three different surveys. One is a local one, and then we looked at two national surveys. The reason we um, chose Quaglia is that it really, one, it had the same conditions for each of the three groups. So each of the three groups, parents, students, and faculty and staff, were assessed under the same eight conditions so that we can make comparisons amongst the perceptions between groups. Um, it also gave us some national comparisons. Not all of the surveys had that. Um, and that um, we would be able to, in the future, add some of our own um, questions. This year, we just did the standard survey to give ourselves a baseline. And next year, we want to specialize and pick some of our own questions. So here, I'm just going to minimize this a second. There you go. And so what you'll see here is our local agreements to the probe and the national. What I need to say about the national, that's 10 years worth of survey data that includes pre-COVID uh, surveys. So our, our survey was this year, we definitely have had an impact in terms of COVID and our student and parent and teacher perceptions. When we look at the national numbers, please know that's uh, 10 years of data for those schools who chose to do quad there. So just so you can see. There is no way to just look at the comparable time. No, they don't have it. They don't have okay. it uh, aggregated that way. Yeah. Um, and so what I did, there's uh, a lot of data. It's all right here, it's a lot. And so what I did is I tried to pick one or two of the indicators by the eight different categories and tried to then use the same ones across um, uh, the different groups that we looked at. But in terms of the principal knowing my name, um, perception, again, these are, this one is students grades three to five, perception of bullying is a problem, my teacher cares about me. And again, these are all very much climate related survey question. Teacher respect for students, giving my best effort. Fun in school, that was interesting. And again, the national group compared to our group, we were kind of surprised by that. I like going to school, surprised by that reporting out. Um, like she thinks I'm a good student, it is important to follow rules, I work hard in school. So again, looking those indicators overall, those are grades three through five. We now look at similar indicators for uh, grades six through 12, 
Uh, school is welcoming, a valued member of my community. Adults in the school listen to students' suggestions. If I have a problem, I have an adult I can talk to. We know that that's something we score very highly on other surveys, um, especially as compared to the state of Vermont, a little lower here, but again, above the national average. Teachers respect students. Um, I know what I need to be successful. If it's not available at the national, that was one of the questions they updated in this survey, but I felt that was a really um, important kind of climate question, enjoying being at school, uh, enjoying to be uh, encouraged to be creative, helping me learn from my mistakes. I'm responsible, it's my responsibility to make sure I'm learning. So some of that agency question, teachers believe in me, expect me to be successful. And I use my voice to express my thoughts and ideas. Um, but, you know, we would want that much higher. And again, we didn't have national comparisons. In terms of the parents' responses, again, grades three through five, I feel welcome in my child's school. Uh, teachers care about my child's problems and feelings. My child is valued. My child is a teacher who's a positive role model. My child has friends at school. Uh, teachers recognize my child when they're kind and helpful. My child enjoys being at school. Uh, interest in what is taught in school. Uh, expected to tell me when they are successful in school. Uh, teachers encourage my child to make decisions. Um, teachers believe and expect my child to be successful. Comparatively, at the high school, 6 through 12, um, again, I feel welcome in my child's school. Teachers care about my child's problems. As a valued member of the community, as a teacher is positive, as my child has friends at school, recognize my child when they're kind, my child enjoys being at school, um, my child's interested in what is taught, excited to tell me when they are successful in school, um, encourage my child to make some decisions, um, believe and expect my child to be successful. And then teachers. Uh, I feel valued with my unique skills and interests. I felt that was really important. Again, how do we make sure we retain teachers? I was listening to a superintendent of a district. They have 75 teachers who are on um, probationary licenses. They have 40 positions that are open. And it is, we are, all our content area positions are full right now. We need, I think, one more special educator, and then we'll have all our positions in really good shape. So. It's important that our teachers feel valued and, and, um, um, and feel that they're in unique skills and interests. So it's welcoming and friendly. I have a problem, I have a colleague I can speak to. Students respect me. Professional development is an important part of my educational growth. I enjoy working here. Students enjoy working with teachers. School is dynamic and creative learning place. Setting my goals with my supervisor is important for my work. We're reassessing how we do that. So every year we ask teachers to set goals. They're not seeing that as important and impactful. That's something we're thinking about. How do we do that differently? This one hurt me. Central office understands the unique culture of our school. You got to figure that out. Uh, uh, you know, we put the, the things that we're going to work on. So I'm working on that. Um, building administration is visible in our school. That's really important. That's grades three through five, six through 12. Again, value of our unique skills welcoming and friendly. I have a colleague I can talk to. Students respect me. Professional development, 80% of students respect them. When we think about the national you know, environment for where teachers are working, they see that 88% feel that way, made me feel really good. Professional development is important. I enjoy working here. Students enjoy working with teachers. School is dynamic. Setting my yearly goals again, that took a hit, some people almost took a hit. And then building administration is visible, 82%, almost 83%. So in terms of our next steps and questions, um, students, we need to investigate the lack of joy for fun students report about their schools. How do we increase belonging with our students? For parents, how do we better inform parents about what is happening in our schools? You know, our newsletters were not in place a few years ago. We're doing that. What else can we do to engage um, parents? as well as increasing parent participation. So we want more parents to respond to these questions. Um, how do we better celebrate teacher successes, goal setting, increasing kind of connectivity of central office, and then what questions do we add next year? So what are those specific questions to our district that we want to add to the survey? That's what I got. 
Sure, sure you remember. Sure. When, when was the data collected? Was sure you um, March. March. Yes. Okay. And February, March. Yes. That's an interesting time frame for uh, given the events that we were all kind of yeah. working through at that point, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then were they anonymous? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's interesting. The it's in, just an observation. The three to uh, three to five uh, grades three to five had much higher participation, right? I don't know if that's numerically representative. If we have more younger students. Um, I don't oh, think that's I true. That. Oh yeah, the upper corner is coming. In the, in the students, in particular, you had like two hundred and five, two hundred one. You know, on, on the three to five. There you go. Huge response, and then much. Smaller proportionally in the older students, right? And I wonder if there is a little, I don't know if you call it selection bias, but who would respond to a survey if that, you know, mm -hmm. someone who's kind of disenfranchised or more, um, you know, apt to uh, enter a lower score would, would just not participate in the survey. And I think going forward, we should maybe be more be mindful about that mm -hmm. to get as much accurate data as we can. I 100% guarantee that my freshman did not do that survey. <laughs> <laughs> Back to elementary school kids, I bet it was something that was assigned during class. No. And then this happened during the advisory. Yeah, yeah. We, we yeah definitely, definitely did. At the elementary schools, I went in and conducted all. Like, it wasn't <laughs> optional. It was <laughs> everyone to them. Yeah. Right. And the other thing I wonder about is that um, just given what we've kind of worked through as a group recently, I, as a group, I mean, our entire district, um, is the, the first question in three to five is I think bullying is a problem. Like, is that you know, is that specifically like, I think bullying is a bad thing, right? Or is it, it bullying is a problem here, right? Because that's, that, that matters. I mean, because I think everybody in the world would agree that bullying is bad, um, but, you know, whether people are saying that we have a bullying problem is a little different. Is this problems. the full question that was on the survey or is this an abbreviated? That was the prompt. So, <laughs> yeah, I think Ben's right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a school climate, and maybe oh, Melissa, school. you can tell me, it's a school climate survey. Okay. What, would you, what do you think in terms there of- There were some questions that I think at the elementary level, the students were, could have interpreted, you know, not the way they were intended. There was definitely some questions like that, that yeah. Yeah, I'm not trying to be really mm -hmm. skeptical. I'm just giving my observations and sure. ways that we could, you know, kind of go. I think this is great. I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, the things that we value and trying to get a uh, kind of a sentiment from uh, all of our stakeholders. Um, but maybe we could tweak it a little. Can I say something just sort of tongue in cheek? I think you could kill two birds with one stone. So central office, knowing the school coach, culture and the kids wanting to perceive school as having more fun. I think maybe the entire administration needs to go to every school, uh, you know, for like spirit days, dressed up, I don't know. I'm just saying, you know, those those two were the odd, like the only ones like below fifty percent. So when so, I showed up in my dinosaur costume and did the West Parade, or last that year, was good. That was <laughs> that being a playing little bear myself and Sarah. Yeah. That was good. Jim, Ben, I mean, well, you, could, you could get involved. <laughs> <laughs> Jim had the option to do the inflatable bear, but he didn't. Uh. <laughs> yes, Laura. I think that this presentation juxtaposed to the scheduling, I have fun at school and we're talking about time is precious and let's cram as much learning into the kids. I think we need to also think about the fun and making sure that that gets prioritized in our scheduling somehow, some way. Sherry, I can't see if anyone's raising. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, on this one. I guess not. I was just applauding for that comment because I, I agree. I think that kids are there to learn and also that uh, we do right by them, uh, making them happy and uh, allowing them space to not be learning all the time. Like cramming, cramming stuff in it. it yeah, I agree, Laura. Thank you. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be an either or um, <clears throat> because learning can be fun and the best teachers, the kids are like, we just came and had fun all year and like sometimes learn stuff, you know? So that's a separate question, I guess. Yeah, and I think, you know, again, we're, we're competing when they were home and COVID and there was lots of choice and, you know, independence. I also think 
when a student can be successful, then reading and math is fun. And when they're struggling and feeling like their peers are doing better than they are, that's when you see kids disenfranchised. And that's when you're seeing acting out. If they, if, you know, if we can make sure that our K-1-2s are really, everyone has the same access to the really exciting content and context and can crack the code together, you know, we really want to map that out to see if that does change our behavior reports. If kids feel like they can be successful, I've never seen a kid who wants to fail. I've never seen a kid who doesn't want to be top of the class in reading math. And it's, it's really early on that that's part of our hope as well. That, you know, being able to read that book that I've always wanted to read can be a, a source of fun. But I think we're, you know, we got some competition in terms of when they didn't have routines and now there's a lot of routines and we didn't have structure and now there's a lot of structure. So, but I'm being like, my extroverted child was so excited to get back to school. It's way more fun than being at home. <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you, Sherry, for that. And um, is Raina going to do talk about the logos or are you going to pull them up so we can see them in color? Do you want to run with um, the um, Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I don't know if I can. There we go. All right, so um, I used AI logo generators, a couple of different ones. Um, that was a lot of fun. Very easy to go down a rabbit hole when you're playing with AI. Um, so there are three different logos. Um, I wanted to put them into something so that you could see how they might look um, how it, when we go to use them. Um, a, is the I liked it because it's the mountains. Um, it's got a little river, uh, some trees, so that was nice. But it's not going to be easy to be replicated. Uh, B is a little easier. Um, I really liked the three peaks because it represents the SU and the two school districts. So I really liked the symbolism of the three peaks. Um, mm -hmm. So I did. Obviously, you can see one under A and one under B um, and three under C because clearly that's my favorite. Um, so uh, we, I sort of thought it'd be nice to vote on the actual logo itself because how we use it is gonna vary based on uh, what we're putting it into, whether it's letterhead or, um, you know, on, a, on something, so. But right, those are the nice. ideas. Just, uh, as clear, just as clarification, we're looking at the mountains, not the font, nor the colors, nor the di dispersion of the of the letters around it. We're solely looking at the mountains, trees, and rivers. Right. I thought uh, it might change based on what happens um, as far as like if school colors change or if the mascot changes, that sort of stuff. So I thought we should be a little bit more fluid with the fonts and the colors. Yeah, I love that. It was more around uh, just suggesting that whatever we do includes the supervisory union and the school district so that we don't leave Ray and Pittsfield out. Right. Are we supposed Ooh, to come any in? other comments? Yeah. Elliot, then yeah. Sam. So I actually did like three at first, but then I started mm -hmm. concentrating on those little stars and they were looking at you know, having those little I know what they are, but they look like little stars and they were, I couldn't see anything else, you know? Like if you look at the, the little black thing, and then now they, that's, that comes out of me first. And that's why I sort of like the second one better. It doesn't have that, but that's me. All right, Sam, and then we've got a couple people on the screen. Um, so I like, the round one at the bottom is the shape. I know what you're saying is it's not like, um, it's more similar to what we're currently using. And it also includes the school district and the supervisory union for um, Anna's comment. But instead of the peaky, I, I don't love the peaky mountains because I don't feel like that's what we the Vermont is. Yeah, it's it's like really the massive really peak mountains. I liked the I like the one better with like the river and the trees. A can you A? Yeah, I like the the A trees. I feel like that is more representative of Vermont mountains. But I would if I was being picky, I would want to take that 
little mountain range and put it in the middle of the green one. Ooh. If I was being picky, I like that. All right, Anne. Sure. Um, so I think similar comment that C feels like to the mountains are too steep. It doesn't feel very Vermont. So I would go, I, I do like the river, but I hear the point that it might be hard to reproduce because it's more detailed. So B seems good too for that sort of not too, the mountains don't look overly steep, but it does seem easy to reproduce in lots of different settings. Any other thoughts? Uh, Laura, and is then it, Bob. So I agree. I love the mountain in A. Is there any way to simplify it that it would be easier to? I like including mountain and river and trees because that's that's what our views are. Okay, um, Bob. Yeah, I I agree with the sentiments about the color green. The the last one, the round thing i also agree that the mountains need to be softened maybe not as steep but softened i'm thinking uh sabra uh, johnson field um if you're familiar with any of her her flowing mountains that might be a source of uh of uh input if not hire to come up with a custom mountain tree thing that's mm -hmm. it Baina, we're just giving you more opportunity to play with the AI. <laughs> I don't know. I really like Saber Field, so I like yeah, uh, get that Bob's idea. idea. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, Raina, I know you had said that you need need us to give you some direction because you're got to get this going and get it ready. So, what's your sense of urgency? I am totally happy to go back into AI and make some adjustments. Oh, and if we have that special meeting, can we do that? I, and then you I clearly like to have something in place for July 1. Yeah. But if we do the special meeting where we need for the, um, you know, Jim's piece, maybe then we can have something we can all give a thumbs up to. Aiden. Oops. Go ahead, Aiden. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give like a quick, just my input on these. I like the logos. I specifically like the first one, just because of like that. It kind of reminds me of like a kind of business aesthetic and more like a professional look. I just kind of like the colorway and how it looks. I see like what you're saying about the mountains, how they're kind of steep and our mountains aren't that mm -hmm. steep. Um, but I do like that image in general. I mean, I would be perfectly happy with doing that first logo, but I would like to see kind of like, I know these was generated by AI, yeah, so maybe we do a little tweaking with that and like if we see those kind of more hilly mountains i mean i i'm excited to see like what we can come up with this using this tool lara i really like the font in a and b because the a looks like a mountain oh, yes. i like that better than the font in c yeah but I, I definitely would prefer to have the words mountain and views be the same size because otherwise it looks yeah. it's like mountain views. But then it's like a, it's a sentence. Mm. It's not what we're going. Well, if I'm permitted to make my my uh, opinion clear, and I know usually I'm supposed to stay impartial, but I like the mountain thing in A, but I like the green with the mountain in the middle um, better. Yeah. <laughs> and I do like that font. Yeah. 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 Anybody else have an opinion on this? Yeah. All right. So if we are going to indeed have a special meeting on the committee night uh, and we all show up together, we must agree that we will at least have 10 of us here to make a vote, <laughs> whether your committee's meeting or not. So we'll work on that. Thank you, Raina. Sure. Great, great work. Um, Jim Fenn. Yeah. And you're entirely sure. Yeah, I'm trying to get psyched up. <laughs> so annually, we borrow a TAN, a tax and presentation note. Uh, this is necessary because our revenues come in from the towns at various times during the year. Um, and just for instance, Woodstock makes their final payment to us the last week in May or the first week in June. 
every year. And so we need to cover our cash flow, pay our bills. Um, in the meantime, uh, what you have is a history of what our TNs have been. Um, we've reduced the amount of money that we're borrowing down to 3.2 million from a high of 4.6 because we we don't need to borrow that much to meet our cash flow. Um, uh, with the loan, the way a tax anticipation note goes, you don't borrow it until you need it or you don't withdraw it from the bank until you need it, but you can't pay it back until you're done. So it's not like a line of credit where you can borrow and pay back. No, once you borrow it, you have to keep it until you're ready to pay it off because you can't take it a second time. Um, Mascoma Bank gave us a bid. Um, uh, four and a half percent, which is higher than what it's been over the last few years, but still well, in today's market, it, says, it yeah. isn't too bad. Yeah. And um, we will need a motion. The motion is there in your um, uh, packet, and then we'll need lots of signatures. Right, I'll, I'll make the motion. I motion that the board authorize a tax anticipation note for $3,200,000 for fiscal year 24 operating expenses, understanding that the note matures on June 30th, 2024, and the anticipated final interest rate is 4.5%. The anticipated final interest rate may change due to a fluctuation in the federal interest rate. Is there a second? Second. Second by Lara. Uh, any further discussion? Ben? Do we have a, a total a cost of, of uh, credit on this, Jim, in terms of like with the, it, it, and the comparison? I mean, I'm encouraged that we're borrowing less, even if, if it's at higher interest rates. I wonder if like the total cost of the can in our budget is comparable to prior years. Uh, we budgeted, I think, $75,000 for interest. Uh, this year we spent less than 60. Okay. And so, so we're going to get really close to the budget next year. Okay. It's in the ballpark. So yeah. That's what you're saying. Okay, thanks. The question I have is if we're voting on this tonight, what, what is it we're voting on on the on the 19th? The 19th is for the three capital projects, which are five, which is a five-year note for each one of them. The eight system of the high school, the roof of Killington, and the design for the new building. So the Voters already approved that, so why are we approving it? We're voting for the loan for them. What, what you're doing is awarding the loan. Okay. Okay. It's it's a different process. Um, this you actually you vote on and you authorize. The other one, the voters have authorized you to negotiate and agree uh, and and come to a, a deal with a, a bank. Uh, we did put out the bid. We put out the four local banks that all have presences. Here in town, the only one that actually bid was Mascoma, and so we're in the process of um, wordsmithing the agreement right now. Sam, um, the interest rate isn't locked in. The interest rate is is locked in now. Okay, it just says that last line. It might may change. Um. For the anticipated final interest rate and rate change? It, it did. We've locked it in. Um, okay. That's lawyer speak for us. Oh, okay. Okay. He wants to make sure that if something happens and it does change because we don't get it signed in a timely enough manner or something, that we have don't have to come back and revoke. Got it. So do you, do you have the yearly amount paid in interest for each of these loans from 2020? 21, 22, 23, and add them together to figure out what we are not using well as taxpayer money? Annually, we, we have paid between fifty dollars and $75,000 a year. And I don't have the exact number I can get them for you, but on top of my head, I don't have it. So between fifty dollars and $75,000 that's being given to a bank for us to take loans out because we don't budget well. It, it, the of the year. It's got nothing to do with our budgeting. What it has to do is with the structure of the tax payments uh, from the towns. 
So the towns collect the taxes from you at certain times of the year, and each one of our towns is on a different schedule. Right. And, but for instance, Woodstock, which is our largest taxpayer, and Killington, which is another large, uh, large taxpayer, Woodstock pays in December and in June. Killington pays in November and March or something like that. So the cash flow is, we, we're, we're four months of the year before we get one of those payments. I, I get it. I just, and the way I look at it is we're, we're still getting money twice a year. There, there's should be budgeting there, but it's okay. I just, just try to figure out how you guys are looking at it. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't have a good answer for you. I know in New Hampshire, the towns have to do the borrowing instead of the schools. And that's where I came from. And so a lot of the towns actually would have a cap reserve large enough to cover their, their contribution for the first Six months. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't know. This. This is a structured month that the way it's been uh, for many years, and and I don't know how to change it. All the districts and all this town and all the cities and all the law do it this way. I can't speak to the cities. All the towns do it this way. I mean, you need money to pay the bills. Is the bottom line. I think it's interesting though. If you had some kind of endowment, right, then there'd be no need for a uh, you know to go to a bank. You can just borrow from yourself and pay it back to no interest. That's what I do. Okay. Um, are we ready for uh, the vote? All in favor of approving the TAN, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Nay. Okay. Uh, Corinne? Your hand is up. Sorry, I was just trying to vote aye. <laughs> oh, okay. thanks. I'll look again now. All right. Well, I uh, so it has passed. Thank you, Jim. Um, Joe, I'm sure you're quite excited to present the next report to us. Oh, I'm sure. Um, 99 for faculty, <laughs> the facility <laughs> condition assessment. Yeah, so I, I don't know if you folks, it's uh, stimulating reading, but um. It, it's old hat for all of us. We, we've been down this road before. Uh, it basically just reflects uh, our past uh, assessments that we've had from day one here. We know that uh, our building over there is at its end of its life cycle, as long with all the systems in that building. So the state uh, reiterated that what they said to us is the uh, majority of it is in fair poor condition. Uh, we have a couple of red flags over there, roofing, some structural stuff that needs to be identified. Uh, in a nutshell, it, it boils down to us putting tens of million dollars into this building just to maintain it, just to bring it up to level. It doesn't give us a new school. So there's going to be some choices that we're going to have to make. Do we want to make that investment, put in tens of millions here and still have an older school, older envelope? Or do we want to take that money and invest it into a new bill? I think those are the two avenues that uh, we have. I don't know if folks have any questions. I don't know if you're able to go through some of this stuff, but it's basically everything we've talked about for the past five years or so. Yeah, I mean, I'm heavily biased, um, as everybody knows, in terms of which of those two paths I'd like to see the district go down. Um, but I thought it was interesting just. Uh, and if anybody wants to spend time with the report, you'll see that there's just a quota, a New England phrase. There's a number of areas where you can't get there from here, right? That there's code issues that this building, you can't make it um, be ADA compliant or seismic compliant, right? And, you know, we are apparently grandfather or we haven't kind of tripped that at this point because we haven't done any major construction. But, I mean, it seems like from this report, from what, like you said, what we've known for years, the writing's on the wall. So, yeah, that, that's a great point you made, um, specifically the middle school. We are unable to do any improvements on that middle school. What we do there would be minimal, and that's the way it was constructed. There are precast concrete planks that are in there. We cannot perforate those that ruin the integrity of the building. So tough choices there. Either we knock the middle school down or do very minimal work there. Um, the other problem is once we reach a certain dollar amount, we will have to bring it up to code. It's going to be extremely expensive to do that. Um, like I said, thought choice here. Um, there, there was one comment in there that was repeated a few times about 
the roof and the gym uh, a rafter being separated or something. Correct. Yeah. Can you just describe in layman terms what that was and what are the implications? Yeah. So the drainage specifically over the gym isn't very well. The it takes a lot of snow weight up there and a lot of water sits on top of that roof. It's not pissed properly and it's been that way for, for decades. So if you were to walk into the school gym and look if, as you come in and look to the outside towards the river, you'll see in a corner position, uh, for lack of a better term, stress cracks going through these cinder block walls that we have. So they're strongly suggesting that we engage with an engineer to see what the loads would be for that roof. I mean, we don't know if we're seeing it or not. I can tell you this, codes have changed since 1950s or the 60s. I, I strongly doubt that that roof would take the snow load that it currently carries, especially if we get a heavy rainstorm after a couple of feet of snow. Um, we've had an episode probably about three years ago where we evacuated that gym. I had gym class in there and uh, folks came out and said, the roof is groaning, making horrible noises. Uh, so we went in there and you could actually hear some stress. We went up and shoveled off all the drains, evacuated people out of that gym. But they're strongly suggesting that we get an engineer in and take a look at that and see structurally where we're at. There's some questions on that roof and how much it holds. Any other questions or comments for Joe and the building's garage holds? One more question. Did the state finish everyone's reports? No. no. We're the first one. We're the first one. Okay. So, so they, have to, I'm just to, they have stated that all the reports will be out this fall. <clears throat> Do I believe that? <laughs> there was an interim thing for the roof, and you have snow removal like routinely so that it doesn't accumulate as much. I mean, there's no good way to get it off. It's a flat roof. Um, yeah. We couldn't get equipment up there. It's not like we can throw it off of a roof, but we do get up there when we know there's a heavy snowfall. And I don't know if they did this before I came, but if we get up and we we shovel every drain out just to right. clear a path for when it does melt. It's time to go, but uh, uh, it's it's been years that that it's just pitched in the wrong direction. It's been years that it's been holding on that way. Okay, so we get some concave mirrors mm -hmm. to melt the snow. Scientists mm -hmm. <laughs> well, got nowhere to go. The <laughs> drains are in the corners, and it's kind of pitched away from the drains. It's just it's it's sagging. It's sagging. <laughs> there you go. And it very well could be that structural steel up there has been well, it's 60, 60 years old. Have we got to the point where we have a number yet on the new build project? Oh, yeah. Is that they yeah. get an official number? Uh, we don't have an official number yet, but we're headed down. The, the last cost thing we got was two years ago, and that was seventy-two million. And we'll see. There's and, the and, and part of this work yeah. now that we're working with the teachers and the staff yeah. students to kind of really look at the plan, and make sure it has everything we want. The next phase is the structural requirements, and again, each time it gets closer to the actuals. The company did come in and survey all of our buildings with Joe back in March and April. So all of our buildings have been surveyed. Uh, when we see the report, uh, you heard what Sherry said, but we'll see. You next time. All right, before we go to the next item, Joe, uh, Jim handed me this paper that needs to be signed. Does every single school board member need to sign it? We, we need a majority. Okay. Yeah. One of them yeah. just requires your signature. Yeah. All the rest, we need a majority. I need a pen. Uh, I can send you a pen. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a pen. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, the next item of business is to approve uh, three new hires: Kathleen McLean, special education teacher at WCS for WCSU. Lorian Adams, SEL teacher for the district, and Ashley Morris, elementary teacher at West. So um, I'm assuming you may have had a chance to look at the resumes, and I'd like to take them as a group, if that's all right with everybody. If there's no objection to that, would somebody make a motion to approve these new hires? I make a motion to approve the new hires so on your agenda. Second. Any discussion? I had a 
question. The um, the SEL teacher is so is that sort of like a floating between different school buildings position? Like that's across the that. That's okay. That's yeah. what I was wondering. Yeah. Okay, yeah. it's a grant funded position, so that's why it's SU funded. But and she's a graduate of Woodstock Community High School. Leanne's sister. All right, are we ready to vote? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Raise your Zoom hand. Any opposed? No, nope. thank you very much. Um, we have one resignation, um, Katie Burke, who's moving on to a new position in another district. I just personally say that this is a big loss for yeah. the, the team. She's been heading up all the school nurses and the COVID uh, whole program was um, her um, at her direction. She's a wonderful nurse and a wonderful colleague. And um, I would ask that when the uh, uh, vote to accept the resignation is done, it's noted in the minutes with regret. Yeah. Yeah. I will say I could not have done accomplished what I accomplished or the team without Katie's guidance. Just her level headedness, her focus on the science, her her research, um, as I said to Katie, it's the first, uh, to Kira, it's the first time I took a resignation and sent a crying emoji, and then I said, okay, now I have to be professional. <laughs> she, you know, would call me at eight o'clock on a Saturday morning, and she'd been working all weekend on, you know, whatever issue and topic. And for her, she feels her work is done here, and she's really proud of what she's accomplished and what her team has accomplished, and she wants a new challenge, and she's moving to a district where her children attend like she could do some great work there. So she's working hard to find her replacement, but those are really tough shoes. So can I give a funny aside? So when she applied, she was very nervous. And so she, I and a few others interviewed her and we gave really questions and she walked out and she said, I didn't think I had the job and we didn't tell her until about six months later she was going to apply. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> yeah. so we were so glad. So she's a wonderful human being, and I'm glad we've had the opportunity to work with her. We've benefited. Is there a motion to accept the resignation? I will regretfully make the motion to accept her resignation. I'll second. Okay. okay. All in favor? More please. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Well, um, before we continue, I don't have quite enough signatures for a majority, so I'm hoping that some of you can make your way here in the next day or so to sign um, this uh, promissory note agreement. Carrie, I just have... oh, sorry, I didn't raise my. I'm hoping to come up for graduation on Friday. Would that be too late to sign? We can make that work. Okay, that would be fine. Okay. Um, I'll connect with you on how to how to do that, assuming that the, the central office is closed by the time that graduation starts. Yes. Okay. And if there's some some of you yeah. who live in the area can come in um, and see Reyna. Mm -hmm. Reyna would have the, the note during the school day if any of you were down this day. I just need one. I've got nine incredibly need really eight signatures. Not a bit to that. Oh, okay. I'm happy so to come by you. on Wednesday. Okay, great, thank you. And so while we didn't receive, a, we haven't, we don't have Tina Gallagher's resignation, I just think it's really important. And I know Karen wanted to speak to Tina Gallagher, who has been our uh, principal's administrative assistant for these years. She is on. Oh yeah, I know, I'm just gonna, and Karen's gonna jump on, but I just, you know, when Beth Lewis resigned, um, we thought we'd never find another, you know, administrative assistant who could fill those shoes. Uh, we now are in that same position again. Tina has taken on this position and done an amazing job. And Garrett, if you wanted to speak to that as well. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, there's there's so much gratitude and appreciation for Tina. So she's finishing her 11th year as my administrative assistant and her time here at the school. And um, it may be cliche to say, but it's so true that she leaves this place such a better place than than she came to it. The the systems, the integrity. The care she puts into it. Um, we often hear about how hard it is to find subs. Because of Tina's works, people want to come to my building and be a substitute teacher in that building because mm -hmm. that's the way that she greets them and and, and makes places in, in together. Um, our whole faculty is is mourning and celebrating at the same time, celebrating her future and her retirement. 
but really mourning her loss. So uh, Tina Gallagher, huge, huge shoes to fill, but really a, a lasting legacy for us. So thanks, Sherry, appreciate the time. All right, I 100% agree with all of that. She is a wonderful person who really has done so many behind the scene things that none of us would even know about and never asks for thanks. So she'll be greatly missed by everybody. Um, so should we accept the resignation? And, yeah. No, because we have the letter. Well, okay. and it, because of the position. Oh, right, right. She's exempt. All right, uh, Finance Committee, do you have a report tonight? Sure, I'll make a brief one. Finance Committee uh, met last month, and um, I think the big takeaway from the, the meeting was um, what I had intended to be kind of an early discussion of budget priorities for FY25. I mean, the budget process is perpetual, as um, mm -hmm. we've suffered through so many of those presentations, can probably attest to. But I wanted to thank Jim Fenn because he showed up at the meeting with a full budget prepared for next year, well in advance. And I think we're starting, not just starting, but we continue to um, enjoy the benefits of having our financial house in order, which is entirely attributable to the leadership that Jim has brought to the position. And we've never had that kind of insight so early in the cycle before. So big thanks to Jim. And um, for those who have ideas about where uh, we can make changes to the budget, whether those are priorities, as we discussed about, you know, leaning into our strategic plan to achieve our goals or to make uh, budget cuts. Uh, if there are things that we feel uh, we can uh, rotate away from, um, let's get those ideas into the committee so that we can get them on the table for next year's cycle. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ben. Um, policy committee. I, I I think Elliot had no idea what he was getting into. <laughs> the constant need to add more policies for one thing. We'll get there. So we do have five policies to briefly uh, bring up. Uh, three of them are for adoption. We've talked about them before. The first one is the grading policy. Remember that is uh, for consolidating our grading systems and for versatility. So I guess I'm requesting a motion to adopt that one. I think we'll do it in order. Is there a motion to adopt? I move to adopt the grading policy. Lara, and thank you. And a second? Second. Second from Sam. Okay. Is there any discussion needed on the grading policy? Okay, let's uh, take a vote then. Um, all in favor of adoption, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any opposed? All right, and okay. that has passed. Thank you. The second one is the administration of federal grant funds. And basically, this is uh, something that is a requirement for us to receive the funds. And it's been recommended by Jim Fenn. We talked about it last time. So again, I'm, I need a motion to adopt that one as well. I'll make a motion to adopt the administration of federal grant funds. John, thank you. Second. Seconded by Ben. Um, any discussion or questions? All in favor of adopting the administration of federal grant funds, please say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? No? Okay, thank you. And uh, in the same vein, the third one is the prevention of conflict of interest and in procurement. And that's for the same reason that we need to have that in place to receive our funds. So I need an adoption motion as well. So moved. Ben, thank you. <laughs> Second. Tom, thank you. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor of adopting the code F24? Policy, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No, thank you. That has passed. The next one is for a second reading, the search and seizure. And we did um, change it a bit from last time on um, Sherry's recommendation. We actually added uh, just a section on implementation, basically that, um, and you can see it here that, um, how the administration would implement it and what the process would be if um, there was anybody that contested it, et cetera. So that, um, that's all there as a procedure. So uh, at this point, we would like to uh, recommend it, um, that this be brought for um, a second, uh, no, I'm sorry, for adoption at the next meeting. Okay. Right. 
So that would be in August? Yeah, at the August meeting. Is there any questions about it? And we'll get that copy of that beforehand to be able to read it. Yes, it's, it's in there now. It's on the link in the you have to go in. Yeah, the, yeah it's not on the printed one, but all of them. Josh, can I? Okay. Yep. No problem. All right. And we have a first reading. Do you need a motion? No, oh, uh, no, because we're just moving it to adoption. Okay. I'll second. Do we have to do that as a board? I, I don't think so because we can't vote on it yet. Okay. Right? Can we no? We have been in the past. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah you just move you make it a mo make a motion to adopt it at the next meeting and then vote on that motion. Right. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right, who would like to make that motion? I like that motion. Josh made the motion. Second. I'll second. Matt seconded. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. And lastly, uh, we have a new policy that uh, we uh, basically have here called teaching and learning, which is basically codifying the education priorities and putting them in alignment with the portrait of the graduate goals. And uh, one of the additional benefits would be that this can help us in selling points in terms of attracting educators to come here. So I would like to ask for a motion to send it to the board in August for a second reading. Okay. Uh, second. Right. Lydia uh, and Anna, thank you. Um, is there any questions or discussion needed now? Uh, Matt, did you have a question? Yeah, I have some, well, just questions. So what is the background of this one? Was this uh, the SBA or did you draft okay. this yourself? So I'll tell you, Bryce started this conversation a few years ago around <clears throat> how do we codify where work we're doing. Portugal <clears throat> Portugal graduate is not a policy. It's really a vision statement. So how do we create a policy that captures the work that we're doing with our strategic plan of working with graduate? What are those things we most value? And so beginning with foundational skills, then looking at <clears throat> Uh, then looking at our deeper learning, also looking at that we always have that approach from a graduate in place. So really is the board's opportunity to create a policy that really codifies the work we're doing, reflected in our approach of a graduate and strategic plan. Jen and I looked at model policies from across the country. There aren't a lot in the United States that are more in England. Um, and so we modeled that, we used some of that, and then we modeled it also of our, off of our education our equity, inclusion, and diversity policy in terms of the, what's our, our vision of that work and what are the key points. And so that's how we got to this policy. This is not a required policy. In fact, it's pretty rare that a district kind of takes that positioning. It helps, you know, in thinking about Nate Levison's presentation around that foundational skills. How do we use resources? So it kind of, it's like a core document, but it, it's the only document we really have as a policy that reflects the, the direction that we've been taking. will be the first kid on the block with it. So since that one has, is new to us, I think it would be great if everyone on the board could take some time and really think about what the words say. And if you do have questions, I encourage you to reach out to Elliot uh, with those ahead of time so that he has time to respond and share them with his committee. There is a policy committee meeting in June. So you could also, uh, between now and then, that would be, I think mo most helpful rather than two months from now trying to go back to that. So thank you. Great. Um, but we sent it along, right? For we August. sent it along. Okay. We did. We sent it along. Okay. Sent it along. Um, all right. Uh, buildings and grounds committee. Do you have any updates for us? Did we need to vote? We, yeah, we oh, did. We actually. actually. I had the question, so that's why I was prevented to vote. Oh, okay. All those in favor of sending it to a second reading, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for correcting me. That'll be in the reflection. Yes. Uh, Matt. Um, buildings and grounds did meet, and uh, we met at the high school to look at the current project underway. Um, I won't summarize everything because it's all in the minutes. You guys can check those out, they're posted. Um, but 
you know, as we think about the state of the building and we read the reports about what's happening, I mean, it's also happening real time. So when they had to turn the heating system back on because it got cold again, the boilers, uh, the gaskets leaked. And so we're in a situation where we need hundreds of thousands. Well, I, will, I won't quote the numbers. I don't have it written down here, but tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, just to repair boilers to have heat next year which means the projects that were in the capital investment plan, uh, painting projects, uh, fixing rot at Reading, a, a lot of things that people want to get done at their campuses are not gonna get done because they have to get shifted out so that we can use funds to fix the boilers that are not working at the high school. So, oh, dash of reality. Um, Joe, is that- Yeah, in, kind of it? in a nutshell, yeah. yeah. The quote from the facilities report, uh, there are two ancient oil fields by the slide the perimeter A for now. So we're we're gonna have to rip one of them apart and actually separate the sections and replace gaskets. Um we can roll a dice and replace replace the ones that are leaking, or we can replace them all. I am voting to replace them all. If not, I guarantee you we'll be revisiting this. And uh, year two next year, yeah. And, and what was the cost estimate roughly just, just for this oil yeah. repair the ballpark? I'm, I'm going to say 60 to 80,000. Yeah, there's 60 to 80,000. But that, like, there were a lot of little projects that have to get pushed out and delayed, deferred, so that we can get this one done within the budget. Most most of these projects are, are cosmetic, it's, it's carpeting, it's painting. Um, some of it is structure. Like I said, we had started some rock repair at uh, Reading, and uh, Matt indicated that we're going to have to push that for one more year. But, but at least you're doing it when the weather is better, so you're not doing it in the middle of. Take it. Okay. It was pretty cold that year last year. No, but I'm saying at least it's going to be nice for this. And, and uh, one more addition to Matt's report uh, things that Jim gets excited about, and I do too. On um, June 22nd, um, we're going to be hosting uh, a landscape electric uh, landscape equipment demo here at the high school for surrounding school districts. So um, hopefully in a year from now, we'll have uh, some electric equipment ourselves and stop producing those gas. Great. Thank you. Well, um, go ahead. So what gas is for are there? Uh, gone. So in between, so our boiler is uh, probably about the size of the freight train in your sections, just like old school boilers. I'm sorry, old school radiators in your house. Yeah. So in between each section are mm -hmm. gaskets, and those gaskets uh, are failing. Yeah. So they started to sitting back with all the. Yeah. Yeah. Occasionally, if 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 you run them, they'll heat up enough where the metal expands and it actually seal itself. Mm -hmm. But you run the risk. Uh, every time you heat that, it'll expand. It makes the have fire marks. They clog. Uh, some of them are clogged, and then yeah. they're caulked as well. So they, you know, okay. okay. Thank you. Um, there's no negotiations committee update at this time. Are there any working group updates? Um, yeah, just a little insight on the new build uh, working group. Uh, June's going to be an interesting month. Um, the architect. Um, in our April meeting, I had set out um, a plan to have the working group essentially split into uh, four work streams that are focused on some of the goals of the work that we're going to be paying uh, for, you know, through the through March of this next year and a detailed design. And those are the first is the education group, which is um, essentially there to confirm or to you know, make tweaks to the design to facilitate our educational goals, right? And so that's the biggest one that's going to be happening here in, in uh, June. They're also uh, the sustainability group, looking at our sustainability goals, confirming those in the plan around it. Uh, our facilities group, that's kind of more geared towards um, the project manager and construction manager, which is kind of setting up bids to get those, you know, ready to bring some additional personnel on. And then the communication group is kind of exciting in terms of um, putting together the uh, plan to to you know have uh, sessions with our communities and talk about you know the the you know the board's um, plans for like you know a new building uh, assuming that the board endorses that. Uh, Sam, yeah, I'll just a follow up about the communications committee thing and 
Are, are you done with the new bill? Yeah. Oh, communications committee. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Communications committee. Sure. No, but I will just wrap up with that. Yeah. Just recognizing that between um, Marlena's work on fundraising and uh, our architects' work, and um, you know the communications, um, you know, working group, we've got some like kind of duplicative efforts that I think we can bring together and some some teams to, mm -hmm. uh, it's a good problem to have. You know, we've got a lot of people who are involved, volunteers and things, uh, and now it's a matter of organizing it, directing it forward. But more to come, I think we'll we'll do the next, um, it, we're tentatively looking at just needed a confirmation for a week from tonight for the next uh, big new build meeting where we kind of, you know, establish all those, those uh, work streams and uh, have a little further micro meeting. So more, more to follow. Great, thank you. Sam? Uh, yeah, well, first I'd just like to apologize to those on the communication committee. I didn't actually realize that I was the chair until recently. De facto. Uh, de facto chair <laughs> until recently um, within the last month. So I was kind of like, okay, great. There's a committee. I'll wait to hear what happens with that. And then I got an email from Carrie like, are you going to call a meeting? I'm like, am I the chair? Oh, okay. Um, so there was a breakdown in communication. <laughs> Um, so, um, that being said, I'm, um, hoping that we can do our first meeting, I'm going to call it now, on, um, the 19th, when there are other, um, committee meetings, maybe beforehand, if others are, um, also in committee meetings, maybe at like 530 or um, I'll put together an agenda because the policy committee is not meeting that day. Um, we're meeting on a different day so I can make the 19th work. Well, I think actually, Sam, that um, there's the people on the communications are not on another committee. So I'm the only one? So, on no, no, it's jo Josh is on your committee, but he's not on another Okay, and and it, so you yeah. could have it at 6 30, in other words, or okay, now it's at 30. And if we should, we're going to have the early meeting, okay, uh, start with a full group that would work out very well. Yeah, okay, great. So 6 30 on the 19th, um, because yeah, I, I am on another 30, so cool. <laughs> and Ellie was like, and you're staying there. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, okay, great. So I promise we will meet before the end of the school year. Um, great. All right, and now we need to approve the minutes of the previous meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Thank you, Ben. Also. I'll second. John got in there first. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes before we vote? Of course not, because Raina does such expert minutes. <laughs> Giving her the love. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, all in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Now we have another opportunity for um, public comment. Is there any person here from the public who would like to speak? All right, then we will move on. We do not have an executive session tonight. Um, I would like us to, we did learn, Sherry and I, in our training, that reflection is an expectation from the Vermont School Boards Association and that we maybe have been taking it, not myself personally, a little too lightly. So if we have some good reflection points to make, this would be a great time to make them. Yeah. Oh, and Carl has her hand up first, and then I was just going to say I appreciate that we had a really tight agenda and are not burning the midnight oil. So thank you. Thank you, and Marianne, and then Ben. <clears throat> I was going to say the same. I know I'm new, but this was the shortest meeting that I've attended. So <laughs> very much appreciated, especially when you don't feel good. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Well, I've been on the uh, on here for like what eight years. This is one of the shortest meetings I've ever been to. So uh, don't get used to it. <laughs> then, then yeah, no, it's great. Right. Long-standing board member. I mean, I I just wanted to thank everybody. Um, one of the things that I noticed in other board members who came on was the need to kind of raise the level of dialogue. Mm -hmm. And just as an example of that, the the um, conversation we had with Nate Levinson, incredible. Right? Mm -hmm. we this the board could not have done that five years ago. 
Mm -hmm. right? And I just want to thank everybody for the attention to detail and the um, attention to pay to, you know, things that are very important to our students and faculty. Thank you, Ben. Um, Anna? Yeah, I'll uh, jump off of that. Uh, I agree with what Ben said, and also current school boards in our area are really struggling. And I really appreciate each and every one of us bringing our opinion, but bringing it respectfully to one another. Um, it really it supports my enthusiasm for being on this board. So I appreciate y'all taking your time and working together on things. Anybody else? Well, I'm just going to make one more pitch for attending graduation this Friday. I know that a lot of you don't have any personal connections, perhaps, with any students graduating, but I can promise you that it is a beautiful ceremony. Um, you bring your children and sit on the hillside if you don't want to sit down with the staff. It's a real community event. All of the communities come together at this one time, and uh, proud parents and grandparents nieces and nephews, many alumni return just to come uh, that weekend and they do come to this. And um, in the past, it was just a high school board. So the high school board members of the WCS you did attend, it's now open to all of us because we are every person for every school here. But if you can do it, um, and you don't need to tell me why you can't, it's okay, I don't, I don't need to know that, but if you can attend, um, in the gymnasium over across the way, there is a corsage type flower for your uh, for your shirt or your dress or whatever you're wearing. And then we do sit down as a group um, near the faculty. And I, I know exactly where to sit. And I know Sam does. <laughs> there was two of us last year. So, yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Um, and if you can make it, that would be, a, I think, a great boost for everyone to see that the school board is there and attending, so thank you. Is it six? It's at six, but you don't want to arrive here too late because parking is a premium. Yeah, I asked Josh now. <laughs> I'll be able to read one. I'll be able to read one. Yeah, I just had a quick question about, um, just wondering when our next meeting will be. Are we going to be meeting over the summer or are we going to come back again in like August? Oh, hell no. August. <laughs> August, the August meeting, Aiden. Okay. So Sounds good. I think Thank it's you. actually August 1st. I looked at the calendar <sighs> or a second, something like that. It's early. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. And Anna, did you want to say something else? Yeah, I just want to invite Owen and Aiden to our meeting on the 19th. I know y'all don't necessarily get to vote, but I would love to hear your input on the logo since. They will be representing y'all, and if you get a chance to, you know, uh, anecdotally, anecdotic, anec you know what I'm saying, uh, survey your your cohort um, on what they think of um, what they think of when they think of a logo. Um, we certainly would would welcome uh, and honor your opinions coming in. Okay. Anyone? Anybody else? All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, Josh seconded it. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Josh, I can print you.